Good evening, everybody. It's, it's my pleasure to be here to talk to you about um, what I hope may be a, a new way to try and diagnose FSHD. Um, as Natalie just mentioned, we, we were awarded a, a grant very recently. I'm going to say I'm very new to the FSHD uh, disorder, and so I'm still trying to get my head around all the complex genetics. But what I think I do know fairly well is, is whole genome sequencing and its use in the diagnosis of many rare genetic disorders and, and cancer as well, but I'm not going to talk about any of that today. Um, I'd like to acknowledge some of the uh, collaborators on our grant, uh, Kishore Kumar, who's, who's up the back there, and Alistair Corbett and Grant Nick, uh, Gray, sorry, uh, Professor Nicholson. Um, so I think others have, have made this point really well today that the ge genetic diagnosis of FHD, FSHD is, is quite challenging in the lab. To do it well, we need to to deconvolute the, the length of this D4Z4 repeat, which is on the tip of chromosome 4. We need to know what haplotype it's on, i.e. what block of DNA that ends up with one little snip there marked by a PAS, a single nucleotide change. We need to know that information and know that it's on the same block. Um, to make things even more challenging, we've probably heard today already that there's a similar repeat array on chromosome 10. So we need to be able to differentiate this one from the other one. And to do that well in the diagnostic lab requires lots of testing and, and gels like this one that I'm not even going to try and explain. But just to say that we thought maybe with whole genome sequencing we, we might be able to develop a, a new way of doing this, or some aspects of this at least. So FSHD is not unusual. Um, this is essentially the genetic... Um, I'll get back to why I don't think it's particularly unusual in the sense that this slide here on the left is endorsed by the Human Genetics Society of Australia and it endorses over a thousand genetic tests. Okay, this one over on the right actually comes from the US. They've known 64,000 genetic tests. So the idea that lots of ge different genetic disorders have a whole range of different genetic tests to try and diagnose them is not new. Many of these things have evolved over time and in concert with new technology that comes along. Um, for someone trying to run a diagnostic lab, as we're trying to do, trying to run 64,000 tests is obviously not something we can handle, um, nor would we even try. Um, essentially, on this slide, I'm trying to make the point that there's a whole range of genetic testing <coughs> modalities available to test different parts of our genome. I'm going to talk about the genome on the next slide. But things like yeah, techniques like NLPA or Sanger sequencing or arrays, each are different technologies to look at different aspects of our genetics different size ranges of the types of genetic variations that we're looking at. Eventually, using this new technique of whole genome sequencing, we may be able to replace a lot of those tests with a single test, which means we don't have to maintain 64,000 separate tests. We may be able to do it all with one. Not all tests could be replaced by it, I'll, I'll admit that, but it should be able to reduce the complexity of the diagnostic testing market. At least that's the, that's the hope. Um, so the human genome, the entire genome, um, has already been introduced from an epigenetic perspective, but I just want to reiterate that the human genome is an extremely large thing. There are 3 billion ACs, Gs or Cs in the entire genome. It's quite big. They're organised into chromosomes as shown on this slide, and they often come in pairs. Well, most of them come in pairs, in that you inherit a copy from your mum and a copy from your dad. Um, only 2% of the genome actually codes for genes, though. 98% of the genome are not the functional bits, as you will. Now, now we know a lot more about them. They were once called junk DNA. But now we know these pieces of DNA between genes control the regulation and how much genes are turned on in different tissues. David already explained very nicely how DNA is packaged and depackaged in different ways to control its regulation. It's part of this non-coding DNA that's involved in that process. I wanted to really make the point on this slide about the haplotype, which is a block of DNA that you inherit from, your, uh, from either your mum or your dad. And that's going to be important because we need to resolve haplotypes properly um, for, for the diagnosis of FSHD. Um, you, David said 3 metres, I'm saying 2, 2.1 metres. It's, it's a long molecule if you stretch it out end on end. Um, if you print out the human genome into books in very small font, this is what it looks like. So it's, it's just a tangible, it's a large amount of information. And what we're proposing is that with whole genome sequencing, you can decode the whole thing in three days from every single person in the room. Pretty incredible advance in technology. 
What I want to make the point on on this slide is I said the genome is large, it's 3 billion nucleotides in size, but genetic variation is very common. So between all these different populations shown on this slide, there are millions of genetic variants. Most of them have very little functional impact on our, on our well-being. Some may predispose us to certain genetic disorders. Um, whereas on the other hand, some genetic variants are completely deleterious and, and cause, cause a range of genetic disorders. So the point here is that genetic variation is common. There's lots of it, and when you start to look at the whole genome, your job is to work out which little, which individual bits cause a particular genetic disorder. The reason I'm able to talk to you about this today is, is because of this remarkable slide. Um, this purple line here shows the so-called Moore's Law, and in this context, it's that prices have dropped by half every 18 months. So the cost of sequencing genomes has started off at sort of the $100 million mark here. In um, 2003 or so, the Human Genome Project was launched, which was the goal of sequencing the first genome. And that took about 13 years and cost $3 billion. And you see that it parallels that purple line. So just by fact, scaling up the factories, we were able to sort of meet that promising cost. But then the second generation sequencing kicked in. You can see the inflection point on that curve. This is on a log scale. This thing started to get really cheap really fast. And that little point down on the bottom right is kind of the reason I'm able to talk to you today about sequencing a whole human genome for a patient. Um, it's a remarkable 2,000-fold reduction in price as what's resulted in approximately the $1,000 genome, um, not taking into any other costs. So it's pretty remarkable how, how much this is, has reduced in cost to the point where it's on par with an MRI or other medically available uh, tests. So the Kinghorn Centre for Clinical Genomics is in the building next door. It's, it's wholly owned by the Garvin Institute. It was established in late uh, mid-2012 with the sole purpose of trying to um, provide whole genome-based diagnostics for, um, for routine healthcare and also for research. Um, when we sequence more and more genomes, we'll understand more about the genetic variation that's in them and which parts of it matter for human health. Um, I've been, been with the organisations pretty much since the start, which has been pretty exciting. We were one of the first three sites in the world to... to res what happened to my dot there? <laughs> Dots move. Oh, I must have moved the whole thing up. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a move. that one should be in Korea, that one's in Boston, and that's in Sydney. <laughs> so we're one of the first three sites to receive this, the, the world's most advanced genome sequencing uh, technology. And I was really enjoyed taking some of the visiting speakers through a tour of the facility earlier today. Essentially, each one of these DNA sequencing instruments costs a million dollars. You have to buy them in a 10-pack, and that's... Um, that's the sort of scale of investment to get into this space. So you kind of have to spend that much to make the price come down, if you will, and you've got to spend at least that much on the automation and all the robotics to make it work at scale. So it's a significant investment in trying to do this. Um, and we're really, really proud to be able to say that over here when we started, we sequenced 80 genomes in a month. But even that's a cool achievement when you thought one genome took 13 years. Started off doing 80, and each one of those really hurt. All the way through to now sequencing nearly 2,000, 1,200, sorry, 1,200 genomes a month. So we're really proud of the fact that we've developed the capability to be able to do that. A lot of those genomes are for research studies, but the ambition now is to turn those into clinical studies to start helping patients in hospitals. We've done a lot of preclinical work um, in, in amongst that research, but now's the time to do it in the clinic. So we launched Australia's first clinical whole genome sequencing, Australia's first uh, service opened in July. We think it's the third service in the world to offer clinical whole genome sequencing. So it's trying to say that we're at a cool opportunity in time to translate this technology, I'm showing you here a request form that a geneticist might fill in all the way through to a, a pathology report signed out with a whole lot of sequencing in the background. Um, and we, we were clinically accredited so that this is now available in the clinic. So this is what I and my team do. Our job is to make sense of all the data that these instruments produce, terabytes and terabytes of data for each patient, and try and work out which bits actually matter. 
And so today I'm just going to touch three or four slides on how we might be able to use whole genome sequencing to, um, to solve some of the main challenges in diagnosing FSHD. So one of the key challenges, as I mentioned on the, the very first slide, is how do we resolve this repeat array length? As many of you will know, if the repeat length is short, that's usually a, a, a bad outcome for the disease, but if it's long, that's usually permissive of a normal, a normal repeat. As I mentioned earlier, we need to be able to distinguish the one on the 4Q, which is the bad one, from the one that's on chromosome 10. Um, and if there's the scientists in the room will know that this type of technology, usually you can't use it for um, repeats. They're usually a hard thing to assess with this type of technology, but I think we've got a way to, to get through that too. The second key challenge is how do we haplotype which repeat, that, that SNP, that PAS thing, right on the end of that, that repeat array. And the third thing is diagnosing FSHD2 and potentially ruling out a diagnosis for any other disorder that looks a bit like FSHD in terms of its presentation. So without going into any of the bioinformatic details here, um, essentially we need to know how many repeat blocks there are, and each block is three and a half thousand bases long, and they just repeat a number of times. <laughs> so using a cohort of nearly 200 patients that do not have FSHD, developed a little mathematical approach to try and predict what the repeat length was in each of these non-FSHD patients. They should all have repeats longer than 10, all the way up to perhaps 100. So this was this very simple algorithm. I'm not going to describe how it works, but I was pleased to see that it kind of starts at 10, which is the, the size range you'd expect for non-FSHD carriers, and goes all the way through to the longer repeats. So what we're going to do in the first phase of the grant that we've just been awarded is to sequence some patients that do have FSHD and do have the short repeats and, and some with long repeats and try and calibrate our method to ensure that we really can get repeat length through through our new test. Um, I think that's going to be promising. The other one required some new technology which I wrote a, another grant to receive this instrument that's called a, a chromium system. Um, what it does well, what I, what I should mention is that this type of DNA sequencing chops those huge strands of DNA up into tiny fragments. And the reason it's able to do it so cheaply is it sequences them all in parallel. A bit like a microprocessor on a computer, they're just getting more and more parallel. It's the same idea with sequencing. But when you chop it up into short fragments, you lose the fact that they all come from the same DNA strand from dad or from mum. This technology should allow us to stitch those pieces of DNA back together and we can work out which haplotype they came from. And that should be able to tell us, what I've kind of depicted here is that there's a 4QA, which is a bad haplotype here, with a, a big deletion in gray, with a little red bar on the end, which represents the, uh, the, the 4QA SNP. So this is a schematic that, um, of how I expect this will look. Um, for the scientists in the room, with some really promising data from this already, that you can resolve a 50,000 base pair region in this part of the genome which we never thought would be possible from, from short read technology. So I think there's a lot of promise. And that's challenge two that we're going to have to prove that we can do with some custom bioinformatics work as well. The third challenge is trying to diagnose other types of FSHD, like FSHD2, which you're, you're interested in genes like SMCHD1 and DNMT3B and many others. The beauty of, gene, of the whole genome sequencing is that the one test with nothing different in the lab can be used to answer the first two challenges and then potentially looking at any neuromuscular gene that may have a similar um, phenotype to FSHD. So even if a patient comes in with FSHD-like symptoms and we don't find any genetic diagnosis of FSHD, we might be able to rule in, say, a limb girdle muscular dystrophy or, or some some similar disorder that, that, that may look like FSHD and vice versa. You might take a limb girdle muscular dystrophy patient or a different type of muscular dystrophy and realize that they actually do have FSHD, which is important when the clinical presentation is quite variable for each of these patients. Um, I imagine there will still be patients where we don't find any diagnosis at all. And in these, we can start to amalgamate all those genomes together and try and find novel disease genes. And as I mentioned on the very first slide, 98% of the genome does not encode for, for genes. It's the regulatory DNA. We're going to get a handle on the genetic variation patterns within that 98% of the genome. And it's fair to say we don't understand what most of that does today, but I think by amassing this data, we'll, we'll start to be able to understand that. 
Um, so one test can be looked at in very different ways, hopefully to address FSHD1, 2, and other types of neuromuscular dystrophies as well. So the take-home messages from this evening's talk for me are that obtaining a genetic diagnosis for FSHD is challenging and can involve multiple follow-up tests. If you order a test and it comes back negative, then you've got to work out what the next test should be, and you order that one and you wait and you get a result, and if that is negative, you order another test and another test. And I'm sure as a patient that must be a, a slow and frustrating process. If we can do the testing once, we may be able to get a comprehensive look at all of the, uh, all of the genes that are important. And I should mention this is all done in a, a highly clinical environment with clinical geneticists who understand FSHT genetics a lot better than I do, with genetic pathologists who understand the impact of all this genetic variation. Um, I think the whole genome sequencing may offer a new way to genetically diagnose FSHD, um, and it's from a single assay without having to customise it. Well, there'll be some custom methods development, but once we've worked out how to do that, it can be applied um, across, across the globe and anyone else that's doing whole genome sequencing. Um, I think I've made the point that we can also assess other neuromuscular disorders in the same test. Which I've also read, again, I'm only new to FSHD, but I was reading some papers that some mitochondrial disorder patients have presentation that looks a bit like FSHD, <coughs> and we can look at those types of genetic variants as well. And we can potentially uncover novel disease genes in patients where we really don't have any answers. So I think that's it from me. Um, thank you for your time tonight and look forward to being able to present our findings next time. Thanks. Sure. Are you doing any collaboration with other institutes that are developing this? Well, definitely. Um, so, Alistair Corbett, right in front of you, we're collaborating with him who runs the genetic testing facility out of Concord, right? Part of that with Gareth Nicholson. And I think Kishore Kumar has left the room, who's a neurologist involved in this project. So, absolutely. And, and just, uh, yeah. We also have cooperation uh, through the Australian Neuromuscular uh, Network with, uh, with other uh, departments around Australia. So, uh, again, we would hope that uh, we'll be able to uh, get some of the more difficult uh, problems and look at them using these techniques. Yeah. I think we've got to have a little period of proving that we can pull out some of the things I'm expecting we can and then apply it to more and more patients through, through Garth and colleagues. Are you intending to commercialise that database that you're building? Not the database, I would hope we can put that all in the public domain, but the, there is a company called Genome.one which is our genomic testing company and they are the ones who offer the test in the, in the hospital environment. And so I imagine that once we've proved this in a research capacity, that company may then take on the ability to roll that test out to the whole of Australia, which my little research group wouldn't be able to do without that vehicle. So I think we're well poised to not only develop the test, but also get it into the clinic, into the people that need it. And that has to be done through a company. Um, wondering how, th thanks very much, very interesting. Wondering how you're in, um, planning to uh, integrate that with uh, DNA methylation studies, which are not, uh, dare I say it, well done in Australia when what methodology uh, by sulphite or whatever, because I mean these days if, if, there, if there's no hypomethylation uh, then people may not proceed to specifically look at smudge, etc, uh, etc. Et yeah, good point. I um, obviously didn't talk much about methylation because this assay itself doesn't look at it. In our grant we did propose in our third or fourth aim to look at at undiagnosed patients in FSHD2 particularly for looking at methylation. Um, I, we haven't solved that part at all, so I'm hoping to work with Garth again on, on how we, we might solve that. Um, but it might it would have to be complementary to the whole genome assay here. Um, it's also perhaps a naive thought that by getting the array repeat array length right, we might not need the methylation as much as we did, but that could be a completely naive statement. Looking like it's a naive statement. <laughs> Any other questions?